Trump facing fallout for pulling America out of the Paris climate deal, but he says it all came down to st saving American jobs and that the agreement brokered by his Democratic predecessor came at too high a price for the American economy. This is Outnumbered on a fine Friday. I'm Harris Walker, here today Megan McCain, host of Kennedy on Fox Business, Kennedy herself. Also from FBN, <laughs> the co-host of After the Bell, Melissa Francis, and today's hashtag one lucky guy. We are glad to welcome first time Senator Mike Lee from the great state of Utah. Well, welcome. Thank you. It's Thanks for be being here. here. Yeah. Oh, oh, and there's more. Hold on. Let me brag on you. Okay. Got a new book out. Well, I have it right here. What am I saying? Written out of history. The forgotten founders who fought big government in stores right now. Senator, so glad again you're with us. Congratulations on this. This is great. This is all about those who were pushing against the ideas of big government, but somehow or another, not even in the cliff notes. That's right. Founding fathers and mothers whose stories are inconvenient. They're uh, somehow incompatible with the way we see the world today. And so they've been forgotten, but I'm trying to bring them back. All right. And we're going to bring this topic back later in the hour and we can talk all about it. I'm glad you're here. Outnumbered today. Let's start with the news. He says it's all come down to jobs. President Trump is announcing America's exit from the Paris climate deal this week, you know. And he says the agreement hammered out by former President Obama came at too high a price for the American economy. Here it is. I cannot in good conscience support a deal that punishes the United States, which is what it does. The world's leader in environmental protection, while imposing no meaningful obligations on the world's leading polluters. Former President Barack Obama hit back, firing off a statement, even while the president was still making his remarks, as you saw, in the Rose Garden. Mr. Obama condemned the president for, quote, rejecting the future and added this, the nations that remain in the Paris Agreement will be the nations that reap the benefits and jobs and industries created. I believe the United States of America should be at the front of the pack. Also blasting President Trump, former Secretary of State John Kerry, who helped put the deal together, and he didn't hold back. It's an extraordinary abdication of American leadership. It is a shameful moment for the United States to have unilaterally walked away from an agreement which did not have one other country requiring us to do something. Uh, he's made us an environmental pariah in the world, and I think it is uh, one of the most self-destructive moves I've ever seen by any president in my lifetime. All right. Great always to have you here, Senator Lee, particularly on a day that we're talking about this, because you were among a small group that really spoke out about this was a smart thing for the president to do. It was a very smart thing for the president to do. This was a bad deal in the first place. It was a deal that President Obama knew could never be ratified as a treaty by the Senate. He negotiated it with no intention of ever seeking ratification because he couldn't get it in the first place. So it's not surprising at all that a president who ran specifically on, on doing this deal and has the power to do that because it's not a treaty and has never been ratified, in fact, undid the deal. Right. And you were among the 22 lawmakers who signed a specific letter. What was that about and why was that important? Well, it was important because this was a bad agreement. As the president put yesterday, uh, we, we need to put Pittsburgh before Paris. We need to put Americans first rather than putting some abstract international norm uh, ahead of the American people. Uh, we have committed tens of billions of American dollars to the Global Climate Fund in this. Uh, we have put off the compliance date uh, for China, for example, for more than a decade. And meanwhile, we're subjecting ourselves to a series of international norms that could end up adversely affecting the American economy. Well, and some of the criticism has been that those so-called norms are rather arbitrary, and so that would have an impact on our economy. The whole time I was talking, Senator, oh. I don't know if you caught it out of the corner of your eye. <laughs> Melissa wasn't throwing shade. She was flat out throwing, just shaking her head saying, this isn't true. It's not true. I mean, it's just, it's an astonishing thing to me because what the president said is true in terms of it's a bad deal. I mean, that is just the fact of the matter. When you look at it, it's also a meaningless deal. I mean, President Obama touting this as being so fantastic, he did almost nothing, even with his overreaching regulation. He didn't even come close to being 
being on track to meet the obligations that he was setting out there. He had no plan to do it at all. There's no form of policing. There's nothing happens if you don't follow it. It's a meaningless agreement. And, and like they pointed out, China keep, gets to continue to increase its carbon emissions through this whole entire thing. I mean, it's That's stupid. It's ridiculous. It's I, it's it's amazing to me to see the left be apoplectic about walking away from something that is so meaningless. All right, yeah. but we don't have total agreement within the Republican Party, though, on this, Kennedy. No, you still have people who want to be liked within the party. And the most important thing, and this is something that Senator Lee points out in his book, we have to constantly ask ourselves, uh, what is the function of government? And I think cleaning up the environment, certainly there's no one out there who wants dirty water and dirty air. And, and people have have modified their behavior and mm -hmm. so has industry but we're really going to see massive change through technology and innovation through the private sector and you don't have to have our government because you know you've got two things going on here one is you're complaining that the United States isn't leading but then you have the rest of the signatures to this agreement mm -hmm. who are relying so much on the United States so which is it and again it's toothless on on oh. one hand there there are no means of policing but on the other hand uh, Heritage says that we could lose up to 400,000 jobs in this country, including 200,000 in manufacturing. You're talking about our, uh, our chief correspondent, Catherine Heritage. <laughs> <laughs> the Catherine Heritage Foundation. No, 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 no. Um, so, real quickly, I just want to get to Megan on this You can this go point, this center, it's fine. All right, you should <laughs> go right ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to build on something Kennedy just said. I, I think it's interesting that a lot of the people who are most supportive of the Paris Agreement and who have expressed some of the most outrage over the last 24 hours over our withdrawal from mm -hmm. it, are people who are now saying, it's okay, we don't need the federal government, we're going to continue doing this anyway through uh, private and that's industry a great point. effort that's and through a great the states. Point. Yeah, well, and so if that's the case, well, welcome right? to federalism. If, welcome to free markets. Yeah. They're yeah. Republicans now. Maybe right. they're all conservatives. That right. sounds like well, a glorious thing. That was my question before the big announcement yesterday. I mean, if it's good for the free market, these companies are going to do it anyway because it's good for their bottom line, right? I mean, they want to continue to, to come up with new ways to handle energy anyway. Megan? Talking about climate change is a deeply politically tribal issue. If you're on the left, climate change is a complete and total religion that they worship at the altar of all things related to it. On the right, it has become something that even if it's uh, genuine or not, seen as something that only the left can care about. And as you point out, I think all Americans want clean air, we want clear water. The problem with this deal, as you pointed out, is China didn't have to do anything till 2030. We had to do something by 2025. And there's a lot of ambiguity in it mm -hmm. for all of the other Arbitrary. countries. So much like uh, many other deals that President Trump has been pointing out, there is an onus on the United States that there isn't on other countries. And I think when you look at it, it is a bad deal. That being said, if the left wants to get red America interested in the environment and climate change, they have to start focusing on green jobs, green energy, fracking. There are a lot of, there's actually a lot of synergy in this with job creation in this country, in the free market. That's what's reducing our carbon footprints, but, fracking. I mean, you, you right, point yes. out if that's exactly right. But if you make it that the apocalypse is coming and a giant flood is about to kill us right now, it just makes people turn off and turn the channel and change their mind on this. And it's just incredible to me that leftists has been so hysterical and so apoplectic in the past 24 hours. All right. So this is related to what we're talking about. Interesting development here. Many state, local and other leaders are bucking President Trump on the accord that we just pulled out of, including at least 30 mayors, three governors and more than 80 university presidents residents and more than 100 businesses. The New York Times reports they formed a group that will submit a plan to the United Nations pledging to meet the United States greenhouse gas emissions targets under the Paris climate deal. Perfect. One, I know, just go Great. right outside. Uh, one of those group members tweeted this, as the mayor of Pittsburgh, I can assure you that we will follow the guidelines of the Paris Agreement for our people, our economy, and future. And Washington Governor Jay Inslee had this to say. Number one, we want to hearten the international community not to give up on their ongoing efforts. You know, we have about 90 million people today, Americans who live in states, that already have embraced some constraint on carbon pollution. It's important that that message is, is received by the rest of the world. Number two, we want to inspire other states to join us. Senator Lee, is this political go-around of the White House legal? 
Is it legal? Of course. I mean, look, it, this was never an agreement in the first place that had been ratified. It was therefore not the law of the land. Had it been ratified, it would be the law of the land. It would mm -hmm. be binding on us, but it's not. And so the fact that people are expressing outrage, uh, first of all, uh, ignores that fact and also ignores the fact that they themselves are saying, as their defense of it, it was toothless anyway. Well, if it was toothless, mm. why are they so upset? You can't have it both ways. And right. go that, ahead, rock exactly. on with your bad self. Like, you want your city to adhere to this climate? These companies are going to do it on their own? Fantastic. I mean, that proves that people can make choices and do things on their own, and you don't need the international community or the federal government mandating it. I mean, they're, they're undermining their own point, and they don't even realize it. Yes, great. Choose to adhere if you'd like to. And those who don't because it doesn't make economic sense, don't do it. Well, and also, if it does make economic sense that's fantastic and again it, it, it shows the, the importance of an unshackled private sector yeah. and free market mm -hmm. because if you have all these countries that are imposing uh, these emission standards and re carbon footprint reduction then you have all sorts of countries in the United States that are going to figure out a way to get their materials there sooner and cheaper and better and I think that's great for our economy and if it saves the planet in the process it's a boon again yeah. for all of that you don't need the Paris Climate Accord but, the, right? but it seems the, it always seemed to me that the Paris Climate Accord was virtue signaling for the left. As we yes. talked about, yeah. it doesn't accomplish that much. I mean, 2025, 2030, I'm going to be 46 at the time. That's a long time to have enough still continue, damage. Bad, still <laughs> continue damage to be done. But the idea that, you know, when you look in, because I've read a lot into this now, and if you look at the nitty gritty and the details, it really isn't accomplishing that much. No. So the idea that you're going to become so hysterical and so angry at President Trump just because he is concentrating and focusing more on America. America first, which he ran and won on, versus being, you know, I don't know, part of this Paris Agreement. It just, it surprises me that they're, 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 they are so hysterical right now because it doesn't really actually accomplish that much. You know, and Senator, I had a question about how it just kind of ties us. We, we saw this with Brexit in the UK where, you know, they were so tied to the European Union both financially and also culturally with immigration issues, so on and so forth. They didn't want that tie. This ties us in ways to the rest of the global community that might not actually be good for us. Yes, exactly. And at the same time, those who were chastising us for getting out of it or saying you're going to be like Nicaragua and Syria now. This is one of the most amusing because arguments. They because they also pulled out of Because they also pulled out. Now, I, I, I've done more interviews on this over the last 24 hours than I reasons. possibly reasons. No one ever says yeah, that. Yeah, ex exactly. I, I mean, the fact that somebody else also made a different decision for entirely different reasons doesn't make us like them. And this yeah. kind of shaming is counterproductive, and it diminish their, diminishes their credibility substantially. Well, it shows that the argument might be weak, so it's a, kind of a yo mama thing in the play yard. <laughs> yeah, you must be like this one, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. We, we are exactly <laughs> like Syria now. No question about that. Senator Lee, thank you for being here. This is great to have you and get thank your you. perspective. All right, there's more. We're going to make more. President Trump is turning to the high court in hopes of reviving his travel ban from six mostly Muslim countries. How is the Supreme Court like likely to rule on the executive order that was already blocked by lower courts several times. And some Democrats are starting to turn on Hillary Clinton. Well, heck, she threw them under all the wheels of the bus as she continues to blame outside of forces for her election loss. Well, we're going to talk about what they're saying, including the woman who ran Hillary's first presidential campaign. Stay close. Fox News alert, the White House is formally asking the Supreme Court to revive its ban on travelers from six mostly Muslim countries. No word on when the justices might take up the case. President Trump's executive orders have been blocked multiple times by federal judges and upheld on appeal. Critics call the ban unconstitutional, and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals says it targets Muslims. But the administration insists it's all about safety. Here's Vice President Pence on Fox & Friends today. We remain very confident that when this matter reaches the Supreme Court of the United States, they're going to recognize the right of the president in the Constitution and in the statutes of this country to control immigration in a way that puts the security of our country first. Senator, this year we have admitted 46,371 ref refugees so far, up 19 percent since May. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. What do you think of what's going on in the courts right now? I don't think it's unconstitutional. Uh, look, uh, Section 212F of the Immigration and Nationality Act gives pretty broad discretion to the President of the United States to take steps to protect the American people, to halt the admission of certain people into the country. Uh, this was done in religiously neutral terms. 
and I don't see anything unconstitutional about it. But the argument that's being made by the courts is it's the rhetoric from the campaign that's coming back to sort of bite them, if you will. Um, is there any way to get around that? This is a real distinction between what we call textualists, uh, those who on the court review the text of a statute or a text of a government action, and those who consider all sorts of other things. Now look, if they can peer into the soul of those who issued this order of President Trump himself and discern his thoughts, that's a new kind of judging. It's not necessarily the kind of judging we want. Uh, let me ask you about that, because I, I think that's a really critical point, because uh, the reliance in some of these cases in Maryland and Hawaii has to do with the president's intent. When he was on the campaign trail, and his lawyers make the case that once the uh, president takes the oath of office and swears to uphold and defend the Constitution, that is a vastly important transformation going from a private citizen to a public citizen, and therefore some of those comments do not have the same legal weight. How important is intent? Well, in this instance, you have to look at the statute. The statutory text gives him discretion. He's utilized that discretion, and he's utilized it under the religiously neutral terms of that statutory framework. That's why I maintain there is nothing unconstitutional about this. You know, why is this president not being given the same type of latitude to make a decision that so closely relates to our national security as other presidents in the past? And I understand the comments that were made before, but based on everything that we know that's going on in the world right now and what those savages mm -hmm. of the Islamic State and other terror groups have said that they'll do to us, and those countries still also being on a list that the former president kept too, why isn't he being given the same latitude? They don't like him. They don't <laughs> like the fact that he's elected. They really, really wanted Hillary really Clinton to like be elected. Him. And they're willing to push back on that in every single way they can imagine. And even some that none of us could have imagined in advance uh, could be done. Uh, but just like we're seeing with the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, in this instance, they will find any and every argument without regard to whether they're being internally inconsistent. You know, we watch the political fighting that's going on, and in the meantime, I mean, you mentioned ISIS. Look at what's going on in the Philippines. I mean, oh, we are seeing Ella. the same slow motion mm. disaster that we saw in Syria, where you see the group come in and take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of chaos going on in the country. They have moved into certain areas. I mean, now people who aren't leaving eventually, I think, are going to be trapped the way the Syrians were. And and you look at the spread of ISIS around the globe. And this is what we need to be focusing our attention on. The president knows this. You think about President Obama calling them the JV team, and now you look at what's happened as a result. I mean, we need to get very serious about ridding the planet of this evil. And instead, we're fighting about what was said on the campaign trail when problems are getting worse by the minute. I mean, I, I agree with you there, absolutely. And, and I don't think that anyone has really figured out that all-important riddle, is how do you redirect these hearts and minds? Is that possible? Yeah. And are we going about it the right way? Mm -hmm. But my question for you is, and it's an immigration question, a lot of these terrorists that we've seen have come from allied countries. You know, countries Saudi of Western Arabia. Europe. Yeah, well, even the UK and, and Belgium mm -hmm. and France. And what about and, the homegrown you know, terrorists? When, and, and when they're born yeah. there and they hold it's passports, it, it's very difficult to shut down immigration from every country and still have a thriving economy. That's exactly right. But the fact that a particular immigration remedy, like this particular executive order or any other, doesn't get it every aspect of the problem doesn't mean that the president lacks that authority. In this circumstance, the president can plausibly conclude that people from certain parts of the world might pose a greater threat, perhaps because their identities can't be verified, perhaps because they can't look into their backgrounds ad accurately because of the absence of any kind of reliable database within the country of origin. If the president reaches that conclusion as to those countries, he has the authority to stop them from coming in, even though, sure, it doesn't end the threat completely. Yeah, there are no. people here who might do us harm. There are people Absolutely. who are resident and citizens of our allied nations who yeah. might do us harm. But that's a different question. Senator, I layer in the fact, and you can look at this with what just happened in Manchester, England, that, that many of these people actually do end up going to those countries to be radicalized. I mean, they're, they're yeah. traveling to Syria and other countries, and then they're going back into the places where, and Yemen, and going back into the places uh, where, yeah, I mean, we're westernized cultures, and they're hitting us. But they're going there to get radicalized or to get weaponized get or whatever trained. it is. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it still deserves a second closer look. And by the way, this is a stay for 120 days. A lot of people don't talk about that either. This is not an overall, I mean, I'm just spitting the facts on it. It's 120 days to take a look at how we vet. Last I checked, we need to do a better job of that anyway. It's a pause. It's a, it's a pause that would allow the administration to exhale and take a, a deep breath and look at the situation. Now, I, I would ask the question, 
Do we really want to discourage this president or any future presidents uh, by subjecting him to this amount of ridicule uh, from taking action in the future that might be necessary to protect us? We know a lot about our enemies. We know that we have sworn enemies who will do anything they can to use our rights, our liberties, our system of laws to attack us, to kill us, to terrorize us. Do we really want to discourage That's presidents? That's a great question for you, though. If we had a Democratic president, what would you say? If we had a Democratic president, I would hope to shout that Democratic president would be concerned about the safety and welfare of the American people, enough so that that president would look and say, OK, maybe we need to take a deep breath on this issue, on this particular country of origin, and say, let's pause that for a while. All right, we've got to move on. The White House is planning to move forward with its agenda despite the Russia probe. And now we're learning more about how the president's team is gearing up. This is fired FBI Chief James Comey gets set to testify next week. Details ahead. Plus, liberal journalists are fuming after President Trump drops out of the climate deal. The New York Daily News is not mincing words on its front cover today. But is the mainstream media ignoring the real problems with the Paris Accord? We'll talk about it next. Fired FBI Director James Comey set to testify before the Senate Intelligence Committee next Thursday. This is we're learning new details about the White House's plan to fend off the Russia allegations. A source tells us the White House is setting up a special unit focusing on the probe that will include lawyers and researchers and communications specialists. This will allow the rest of the staff to work on promoting President Trump's agenda. Hmm. All right. The unit is being organized by White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus, Senior Advisor Jared Kushner, and Chief Strategist Steve Bannon. Megan, isn't this what they should have been doing from the beginning? Like assign a special team to work on it? So let yeah. everybody else do their real job? So Reince Priebus is staying. He's not getting let go. He's not leaving. Right. Like right. There's a lot of reports on the Internet that he is. The ideological differences between those three men are, are intense. I mean, true. Jared Kushner was petitioning to have President Trump stay in the Paris Accord. Steve Bannon was a vocal critic wanting to pull out. Obviously, Steve Bannon ended up winning. You know, the masters of disaster, I believe the war room was called with President Clinton when he was in the thick of the Lewinsky scandal. It's not that I don't think putting this together isn't a completely smart idea, but at a certain point, you also have to get Congress and the Senate involved and start winning over hearts and minds in our own party as well, or at least hmm. trying to make them get on board. So hmm. I they haven't shown me that they work well together at this point, and they're all ideologically on the same page. So until I see the results of this, I'm also going to take a pause. What's your reaction to that, what she said? Look, I find the entire thing frustrating, because uh, you're exactly right. I, 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 I totally agree with it. But I find this entire issue frustrating because I have Democratic colleagues who have seen a whole lot more classified information than I have because of their positions on the Intel Committee who have looked at this and said, I, I have yet to see a single piece of evidence indicating any amount of collusion between the Russian government and any presidential campaign. Uh, that being the case, people were awfully obsessed with, with this issue. And uh, I, I, I look forward to the day when people can say, OK, we got to the bottom of it. There was no there there and move on. Yeah, you know well, what, even uh, Maxine Waters has said there's no evidence. <laughs> like, yeah. Right? I mean, th th this seems to be a theme here that there's no evidence, but there is evidence that there are all these other things we need to get get done. I'm sorry, Kenny. Oh, okay. no, not at all. I, mean, I just wanted to build on something this senator said, because, you know, if it is all about the Democrats having a communication strategy to distract from the, the greatest election loss in, in the history of Hillary Clinton's uh, long and boring life, then <laughs> they're doing a great job communicating that. I mean, they're doing a, a fantastic job of driving the narrative. Can you imagine if they actually had ideas and if they were able to communicate them as effectively as they are uh, the entire story about Russia. Well, they would have won the election. So many news outlets uh, glued mm. to every every shift, turn, and, and leak. Yeah, yeah. it's got to be too tempting because if it were true, it would be so glorious for them. They yeah. would love it. But the fact that it's not true is kind of a nuisance for some of them. And that's why I look forward to the facts coming up, because the facts, I think, are going to show there's well, nothing there. But when you get down to the strategy of what's going on in the messaging, I mean, because, Megan, you've been a, an accurate and vocal critic of the messaging that's coming out of the White House. Now maybe we don't have every press briefing dominated by questions to Sean Spicer about Russia. If you direct them somewhere else and you have another that's team hope. that's working on it, I mean, this yeah. is what the Clintons did, and it was really effective, right? You guys don't, again, there's so much leaking coming out of the White House. I said a lot 
months and months ago that they needed to get that under control and find out who was doing it. And until they get their own internal team in order and really, you know, start, there is, they do have the capacity and ability to help control the narrative, and mm -hmm. they're not doing it right now. So the idea that sort of Reince Priebus and Steve Bannon, the two people that have already been running the White House, are going to make that happen, I'm just a little, little skeptical because I think you would have done it already. Mm -hmm. So I think fresh blood coming in really wouldn't hurt this White House. I, I don't know that we have an indication that this is the end of the changes. I think Megan brings up a good point. This, this is what we know right now. But I'm curious to get your take on this, because if a war room type situation, focusing, focusing on you know, all the incoming in terms of scandal or investigation or whatever they think they're going to be working on, um, while they're doing that, can we also look for the leakers? I mean, could they also be yeah. maybe doing that? I don't know what you've heard or learned or would hope for, but anybody who's not on the side of the White House probably needs to go at this point, I would imagine. Yeah, I think that's right. And the Attorney General, my friend Jeff Sessions, is doing an aggressive investigation into that issue. This is a problem, because if you've got people close to the president, if you've got a, a Judas in there who is Or using, many of them. Uh, or, or many Judai, I, I guess would be the plural of Judas. <laughs> uh, then you've got a real problem, because people are using their access to the president to get information that's either classified or highly confidential or both, and then leaking it deliberately to harm the president, that's a We're big problem. We're putting the rest of us at risk, but then actually, actually, you know, In the actually. process of doing so. And so they've yeah. got to get to the bottom of it. I'm confident Jeff Sessions will be able to. These things are very difficult to detect. But increasingly, people do leave breadcrumbs. They leave signals. Yeah. It can't be done completely enough. And, and, and it's sure. become so normalized, the leaking, that I'm sure people to whom it would have never occurred before are now like, well, well maybe I'll call the Washington Post. Right, exactly. exactly. That is the problem. All right. Yeah. Well, some in the mainstream media, speaking of which, having a meltdown after President Trump's decision to quit the Paris climate deal. The cover of today's New York Daily News with the headline, Trump to the world, drop dead. That's not dramatic. The Weather Channel's website urging readers to be outraged with headlines like, don't care, proof you should, and even more proof. And liberal journalists also sounding the alarm on TV last night. Just watch this. Hmm. It's a very dramatic, symbolic blow. As I've said, the United States has almost resigned from its role as leading the world. Dark speech, and as you go through it, more like four or five uh, dark speeches. Now to the impact in cities and states across the country, where the effects of climate change are already being felt, and many leaders are already vowing to fight back. It's a momentous moment, and a very ominous moment. History is going to punish Donald Trump for this decision. And the question is, how much will it punish our own country? Well, there you go, Dan, rather tarting up the fake news. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> is it a surprise to you to see this reaction, not only from some global leaders, but also journalists in this country? No, not at all. Some of these same faces have been making comments like this since the Grover Cleveland administration. And they Ooh, continue to do it today. <laughs> uh, they're, they're still moving forward with it today. It's predictable. It, it's almost automatic. I heard the same talking points over and over and over again over the last 24 hours since the president's announcement. And Every single time they follow the same sequence of talking points, as if it's as if they're within the matrix. They're all, all uh, speaking uh, through one network. Yeah, it's interesting, though, Melissa, because no one is acknowledging that the air actually has gotten cleaner. The environment has gotten cleaner, and there are a lot of industries and companies that are doing so much, but you're not going to hear that side of it, which is very odd. And, and it's, it's almost heresy to cast any sort of a skeptical eye on the accord. It is, absolutely, and we'll all be vilified from this couch, and, you know, the Internet will light up, no doubt, from the left of anything any of us have said here. But I was surprised by even by seeing Savannah Guthrie saying, you know, that in the cities where they're already feeling the impact of climate change, you know, like children are suffering, um, and and here we are making it even worse. And it's it's just it's interesting how deeply they've bought in. So so what's what's really intriguing about what you're saying to Melissa is that it isn't necessarily mutually exclusive for some and some in the conservative group as well to look at this and say that yes the climate is changing it doesn't mean that it's being man-made in terms of its cause or its worsening those two we can talk we can have a a conversation that has two topics at the same time right and we can also take it to a third step look look uh, um, there's the question of whether and to what extent it's warming whether and to what extent human activity is to blame there is also a third question that very often gets left out and in some ways it may be the most important question which is what 
if anything, can we do about it, even if right. the answers to one and two are yes? Yeah. I have yet to hear of a single proposal, a regulatory proposal, a treaty, international agreement of this, that, or, or the other, that would promise to deliver anything substantial, anything other than a tiny fraction of a degree over a very lengthy period of time while simultaneously threatening great harm to the world economy. But, you know, part of the problem, though, is, and Megan, I will pose this to you, it's almost impossible to forecast these things. Mm -hmm. And and if, if it were possible, then Manhattan would be underwater right now, and we'd be snuggling in the depths of the ocean with... Polar bears. Well, it was almost bad during San Hurricane Sandy. No polar bears, but certainly a lot of water. How do we mean, do that underwater? I don't know. I'm, I mean, sprout gills. You know, I, in water world. I consider a myself movie. a conservationist. I don't consider myself an environmentalist. I think it's completely fine for the American public, especially young Americans, to care about the environment, for wanting to have cleaner drinking water. There is evidence. Coral reefs are dying off at larger numbers. The ice caps are melting at larger numbers. We can have an argument and debate about why and how apocalyptic environmentalists have been. And I am angry at the idea that we can't all care about the environment that's become right. such a politically tribal issue without it going automatically to you're going to die tomorrow, you're the, the end is nigh, yeah. all of these things. Like We have completely disintegrated any idea of anyone coming in the middle. And for young conservatives like me who do, the, I freely admit, terrorism just much bigger on my list of things I care about. But is it in the top 10 things, 15 things I care about? Yes, of course. But the problem is, and I've, I've talked about this many times on the couch, I used to work with environmentalists in Los Angeles. Many of them do not practice what they preach. They fly around private jets, right. they go on, on <laughs> yes, yachts and cans, right. things like that. And there's, a, there's an expectation level that average Americans need to give up, you know, the light bulbs that help with the environment cost yeah. more. That the average American that doesn't have the same kind of income needs to sacrifice more than these billionaires. So until these billionaires want to lecture point. me, and by the way, did lecture me a lot when I worked for them, want to step up and actually practice what they preach and live yeah. by this lifestyle, stop think, flying around on private that, jets, that sacrifice then, is, is then why Donald talk. Trump is president. Yes. And, and I exhort you and your colleagues to pass health care and tax reform so we can get the yeah. economy moving so everyone can afford to buy a Tesla. Senator Lee, can uh, you get that done like this week? Yes. Okay, okay perfect. perfect. <laughs> By the end of the hour today, All right. I will have it done. Such an overachiever. All right, very good. <laughs> Hillary Clinton on the attack again. But cool. some Democrats are now starting to turn on her, saying it's time to move on and for the party to look forward. Are they right? What a tunic. <laughs> I am really worried, and I worry not just because there are partisan differences, but we're, we're living in such an abnormal time uh, when we look at the way that this White House is behaving about some of the biggest challenges we face. It is deeply troubling, and it is also worrisome that it could cause lasting damage to our institutions. That's Hillary Clinton on the attack yet again, slamming President Trump one day after blaming 24 different things for her election loss. But now some Democrats appear to be turning on Clinton, including the woman who ran her 2008 presidential campaign, Patty Solis Dole, tweeting, quote, I heart Hillary Clinton, but I'm tired of hearing who and what she blames Ooh. for her loss. Want to Ooh. hear how Democrats can win in 2018 and 2020 and beyond? Time to move on. And Democratic Senator Al Franken agrees. Watch what he said. I think she has a right to analyze what happened, but we do have to move on, and we have to move on by proving that we are the party that cares about the people who voted, a lot of the people who voted for Trump. <laughs> Senator, I'll start with you. What do you make of Hillary Clinton giving interview after interview, blaming everyone except herself? When my kids were little, they used to watch this show, and it had a song in it that was very irritating. It was called The Song That Does Not End, and it always sounded like it was about them, and it just kept going. <laughs> she reminds me of that when she keeps talking. It's time to put the 2016 election behind us. I think yes. of another song. I mean, when she went off a couple days ago in that speech about wow. how it was the DNC, and she named people who were friends, I was thinking the wheels of the bus go round and round and then she just stuck everybody under those yeah wheels. she's mm. rolling over bernie sanders carcass man you're right about that but here's I, I watch this and i think to myself i think about people who were torn between these two candidates and ended up voting for president trump 
And I, I listened to what she had to say, and it was so incredibly selfish. Yeah. It, you know, these the speeches and the excuses, they're so self-centered that, you know, you look at Democrats and they have to be frustrated because if you're looking ahead to those midterms and the next presidential race, is this really what mm. you want to hear? Yeah. Like, her constant retrial, it, it borders on mental illness, this I, obsession. I, yeah. I look at, here she's at a tech conference, and people have come in to hear about innovation or technology or whatever else, and instead they're treated to an hour of her blame. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone I'm laughing. on Technology. the planet. I mean, it must have been so frustrating for the audience. She Including got away, tech companies. Right, and she got From away with... a woman who had a secret server. I'm sorry, right. Melissa. She, and, and she said things that other people wouldn't get away with. You know, when she went into it, sort of bleeds into misogyny. You know, they're going to be much more skeptical and critical of somebody who doesn't look like and talk like everybody else who's been president. And, you know, President Obama broke that racial barrier. But, you know, he's very attractive, good-looking man. Mm. What does that mean? I mean, like, he was only elected, he was only able to break the racial barrier because he's attractive? And is she saying, by implication, she couldn't break the gender barrier? Why? I mean, if you said this person only got elected because they're attractive and not because they were Feel good, the and this other person's a minority, I mean, round. can you imagine how you would be vilified? I mean, the thing she gets away with saying, it's incredible. And as a, as a particularly attractive man, I'm very <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that was an attractivist statement. <laughs> Just this whole idea, though, and, and I can't even imagine what it would be like, because I've not been there and been, you know, front row seat to history as you have, Megan. But when someone loses and they take that introspective look and then they say, well, I still want to be relevant. How do I achieve relevance. This isn't how you do it. You come back with ideas, as you spoke of. You also you put country with... first. You have if to you put can, America first if you can and put it in front of you. I mean, again, I don't know anything about the Clintons' family life. I don't know about their staff, but I know that if my father were on TV doing and saying these type of things after he left, I'm telling you, everyone in my family would have a stone cold conversation with him and not let him back on television and I we do have the women in my father's life do have that kind of Im impact on him so it surprises me that Chelsea and Bill are letting her ruin what whatever is left of her legacy right now because mm. even young Millennials that are sort of you know because the, there was a certain group of women that did that did like her oh, yeah, I think they she's the ruining car. her reputation right now and whatever resistance she thinks she's being a part of she's single-handedly destroying it at this moment and it's 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 really 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 sad sad to watch for a lot of different reasons because women if we lose we don't need to become pathetic we could rise back up and she had, she could have a great career in front of her but yeah. it looks like it's just never going to happen yeah mm. the victimization it's All not right. powerful i really would love it if hillary clinton would not do any more of these interviews at least over the weekend so i don't have to deal with this on monday all right there are founders <laughs> of our country who have never gotten their due until now up next senator mike lee's new book telling the untold stories Ooh, of those la. who helped keep big government in check we'll be right back so excited to talk about this. So our one lucky guy, Senator Mike Lee, is shedding new light on the unsung heroes of our nation's freedom. It's all thanks to his new book, Written Out of History, The Forgotten Founders Who Fought Big Government. In it, he tells the story of those who fought the abuses of big government and helped shape the Constitution, but have virtually were ignored from our history books. First of all, I want to talk to you about how they were ignored, marginalized, censored in some cases. Your example, maybe, maybe a good one for us? There are a combination of factors that led to this. In some cases, people were just forgotten because we've had more history pass under the bridge since then and we've moved on. In other cases, it's a little bit more aggressive because people don't fit with the narrative. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, one of the lost founders who I focus on in this book is a woman named Mum Bet. Mum Bet was a slave in Massachusetts at the time of the revolution, at the time of the founding. And she fought for and won her freedom at a time when no one did that. Mm -hmm. She was present at the time of the drafting of something called the Sheffield Declaration, which ended up getting put into the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. And that Constitution, by the way, was written by John Adams. It declared that all human beings are free and equal, that these are natural rights and endowed to all people by God. And when she realized that this was part of the Massachusetts State Constitution, the same document that had originally been drafted in the home where she served, mm -hmm. she thought, 
I'm going to go and do something about this. And she sued her master. He's seeking a writ of replevin. This is something you go after when you're trying to seek the return of property. Right. And she won her freedom. Wow. It, this incredible. story doesn't fit our narrative in some ways because it focuses on the fact that this debate about slavery, about mm -hmm. the equal rights of all human beings, was alive and well at the time of the founding. Yeah, you know, one of the things that your book points out is that the Constitution perhaps was not as popular as some might think. You know, we embrace it today, but not so much in the past, maybe. Not so much in the past. There were a number of people I focus on in this book who actually ended up opposing the Constitution, even though they were patriots and even though uh, their warnings are very valuable about what the Constitution means today. They pointed out that there are grave risks in a central government. We have to remember that at the time of the Revolution, uh, our big fear was it, not just a king. It was actually not very much about that at all. It was the fear of a distant, all-powerful national government, mm -hmm. one based in London at the time, that mm -hmm. recognized no limits on its power and was slow to respond to the needs of the people. They didn't want to create another big central power. So that's why some of the founders like Luther Martin, who participated in the Constitutional Convention, drunk most of the time, by the way. Uh, mm. Great um, story, by the way. I mean, that's a fantastic chapter. People have to read your book for the storytelling alone because it really pulls you in to the process. And you realize how contentious and, and how ongoing it was. And you call the Constitution uh, the greatest governing document that has ever been written. Uh, have we failed our Constitution by being too much of a centralized power now. We have certainly departed from it. We haven't failed it in the sense that it, it's, it's not gone. It's still there. It's just that in order to give life to it, in order to give meaning to those structural protections that limit power and keep it diffused and close to the people where it can be quickly turned around, we ourselves have to understand the stories that led to its creation. That's why I wrote this book. That's why I wrote uh, written out of history because I want the American people to have mm -hmm. these stories because it'll influence our cultural attitude toward government. I love Thank it. you for talking about this. We're going to be right back. Stay close.